Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. Today with me a returning guest has found Boucher, author of one of the most read articles we have on our platform, as well as one of the best episodes we ever did. Today he's back to speak about the pursuit of perfection, around forecasting and planning, and a very important topic, the impact it has on mental health. Let's go. I think you are the first guest to come back, so welcome one more time. That's fun. How are you doing? Thank you very much. And thank you for having me again. I'm fine. And how have, how have we been doing? How are you? How is everything? I'm doing well. Busy couple last few days, but doing well. Excited also to have you here. We were discussing this offline. It's just super timely because you have been doing and writing a few articles recently. And I think it's always good to have you back. Everyone loves to talk about forecasting. Everyone loves to talk about planning and more the technical side. And I think you are a perfect guest. Every time we need to go deep on those subjects to, to have you in for, for another round. So thank you. Back, really. I was away for, for a little while, but then I, 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 missed, I missed writing. I missed you know, being in conversations, contact with the WFM community. So I decided to come back with not one blog, but three of them. And it looks like it worked out. <laughs> so it's, it's always good to have you back. And let's start there. So what have you been doing? It's almost a year since the last join us on the podcast. So what have you been doing lately? I have, I have been to, I think, two different places. There is my main company, Askrabit, where I am a workforce management analyst. I've also created my personal one-person company for work special management consultancy. <laughs> so, and I, I worked with one client for, I think, seven, eight months. It was a big success. But sadly, my contract finished. Now I'm more available because of which. So that, that's why I'm focusing on, you know, writing blogs, creating the likes of the package. Yeah, but it was, it was, it was an amazing time. I think I grew in my career. I also have written my thesis in master's. Congrats. <laughs> it also happens to be in workforce management. So that's also part of the reasons I'm able to share blogs. I have a few more coming up in, I think, in very new and interesting topics related to workforce management. Yeah. So it was, I should say, some busy seven, eight months, but now I'm more relaxed. Yeah. And, so, I, and I have to say that the, the WFM community benefits a lot from from what you have been doing. I think you have been doing a wonderful job giving back. And like I said, I think it's it's always good to to have you back. And and let's start there. Like I wanted to actually surprise you with the number. So you have been, like you said, you have been away for, for some time. You just got back full power with three great articles that touch on forecasting and planning different, different angles, but touch on, and even on scheduling, touch on very interesting topics, which we'll go there in a second. But I wanted to surprise you with the number. So I was doing some research on how, how much have you written, how much have you contributed? And I just realized that you, you are very close to a mark, which is 4,000 reads on your articles. Like you are very close to that mark. And I wanted to say congrats because like I was looking at the numbers and it's like your articles are always like attracting loads of people. And for everyone listening, if you if you didn't read, please go. It's on our WFM website on the under the blog page. And you have amazing articles, very deeply on forecasting, very technical. If that's your kind of stuff, you will find it there. So that's on like almost 4,000. Uh, I, I, I didn't know if you had the, the I, sense I, of that. I expecting this. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I didn't check really. I didn't check how many views I got on the latest ones. I kind of know the, the previous ones were quite popular on your website. But that's, that's really encouraging. I think I should write more. Yeah. It looks like I have a huge fan base. Yeah, you have you have a great. That's exactly what I was going to say. You have a huge fan base, so I think everyone is happy that you are that you are back. So you already said what you have been doing. Uh, wrote articles, like I said, very recently that they've been like great successes from our calculations, and you touched a bit on on Python as well, and by kind of like capacity optimization with R mainly. You touch on account requirements, SLAs, HT, and all the different dynamics that, that are related with that and how to understand really what really matters on the staffing process. But you also wrote one about planning on how many actual ads do you actually need that goes into a different analysis. Without going directly to the blogs, I wanted to 
ask more about. So in this time you were away, you said already where we have been doing. Any kind of new developments or things that touch on kind of this forecast world since our last conversation that that you think that are impacting and shaping kind of like the future? I think at the time when we spoke, AI was not booming as it is right now. So I, I'm wondering like what your thoughts are on how much did the future evolved in the, in the span of less than a year? Sure. I don't think it's anything new, but I think it solves one big question that we had in workforce management industry as general. So <clears throat> many planners like me, we're able to calculate using, you know, those existing tools, calculators, how many FTEs that you need in every interval, right? We weren't able to figure out how many heads we actually need to hire because the pair interval requirement is different from one interval to another. And you don't hire people for intervals, you hire people for days and weeks and months. There wasn't any algorithm which could tell us how many heads you actually need, or how many heads if combined in certain way, and if one of them is doing certain number of hours a day, a week and certain pattern, if you have part-time hires, if you have only full-timers, then what's that magical number that combines to give you the headcount requirement that you have just calculated, right? Mm -hmm. I think I am on the way to solve this problem. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah, and our WFM, the package that I was trying to introduce, basically has functions that can calculate for your own combination of parameters, you know, human resource requirements, labor law requirements, your agent's availability, the shift length, uh, number of days combination, all those parameters put in, it is able to tell you that minimum number of headcount that you will need, which is also the most optimum, that can achieve the service level that you need while also giving you the schedule efficiency. At, at probably the best cost efficient relation, right? Yes. I, I think it's a, it's a breakthrough in this industry. It really solves a lot of issues because we workforce management would naturally do this in trial and error method, trying to put shift shell combinations and see if they combined could meet our requirement line. That's not an easy task. It takes maybe days, weeks, can even take months, you know, while doing mm -hmm. this. You can do this with a single function using your favorite programming tool, or maybe even Excel in the future. That would be awesome. And I'm, I'm working on it. I think I've made a huge progress. This has been really interesting to me. There were questions at WWFM chat groups yeah, on Telegram, on, on Discord regarding this. I, I think I was inspired by them and the fact that I wasn't only the only one struggling. Yeah, it's, it's a question. Everyone struggles with this magical number, right? Yes. So my, my R package now can do this, right? But it's very slow. So it needs more optimization, maybe more optimized code that can do this faster would, would be appreciated. Maybe on faster platforms than, than R, the, the likes of C, C++ would make it faster. So th this is basically, I think, one thing I should say I have improved in the last six, seven months. And, uh, and, and that's a, that's big news. I'm, I'm excited for you. I, to be fair, that's something that... I think every single one debates, like there are approaches on how to mitigate as we get more experienced, but that magical number or the number that you just look at it, it's done. You don't need to do other, anything extra. Yeah, that's there. It's not only the number. It can also tell you what every one of them should, 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 should that, that should shells. Basically one of them should be assigned. Oh, that's even better. Yes. <laughs> I believe this is a, this is a huge state. I, I will be happy to work with, you know, anybody else who's interested in this. I think we're on the right path, yeah? The future of WFM will definitely be, I think, easier. You, you tried to mention earlier that people can be stressed out, right? Because mm -hmm. figuring out that magical number is stressful. It, it's hard and you, you may not be able to get exactly that. And then because of which, you know, your goal, service level and others may not be met. So we, we, can, we can really help people to focus on what really matters, avoiding all these tedious calculations and trials. And yeah. Yeah, I think so. Let me ask you a kind of a provocative question. Do you think the reason why it doesn't exist, to be fair, or we don't, at least I'm not aware, is it because technology was not 
here or was more about no one really cared? I think people knew that there was a need for this. People would also care. But the fact that literally everybody's scenario is different, right? There are so many parameters, so many things you need to consider when you figure out your headcount requirement. Your parent level FTE count, labor law, which also changed from one country to another, some customer center specific rules and regulations, agents availability, you know, literally everybody has their own availability, right? So something that works for all these con conditions, for all these constraints, it would be hard to come up with. That's probably why people didn't give too much focus to it. I know there are some, some you know, advanced WFM tools which try to generate the schedule for you, right? But they do not really consider all those constraints because it's just hard. And it, the, the processing time and memory space <laughs> required for this is also huge. And if you are creating a commercial tool, you need to appeal to masses, right? Masses. It's got to be fast. <laughs> you cannot be doing something huge like this at an individual level. That's a problem. It's a good point. But I think, to be fair, and I'm just being a bit biased, maybe, I think technology is evolving so much that, back to your point about computing power, like, the more and more we are cloud solutions. So let's take back 10 years ago, no one was, almost no one was on cloud solutions. Now that we have com computing power in, in the clouds, we have, I think, more agile and lightweight softwares because everyone is realizing that it's better to have machines computing power and not all, every single assumption manually inputted because otherwise it's just overwhelming. I think if the bigger players or even future bigger players, because technology is evolving so fast, start Thinking about that from the beginning, I think it will, it, it will be better for everyone. Like, like you just said, like having that ability to compute larger algorithms, larger data sets, like for certain businesses, the weather can be a factor. For certain businesses, like, I don't know, certain TV shows can be, and, and marketing activities on TV can be a problem. So there, there are so many factors that really are, contingent on the actual business. But if you allow ways to have machine learning those different variables, even if you are, if you need to configure and, and code kind of like bake in what those are, I think there is a, a huge opportunity. Let's see. I, I think to be fair and honest, my personal opinion is that the WFM is still a very traditional industry. We have been doing things for years, more or less in the same way. We have been evolving. I'm not going to lie that I don't want to everyone to take this wrong, but like even the bigger providers on WFM have been evolving. They have been looking at things differently, which I, it's good because it helps our industry. But the truth is no one or a very limited few are going very disruptively. It's still back to the masses, like what suits, even if it's manual work, it's always better because it's faster. Time to market is faster. The errors, even if there is, it's like percentually it's probably small on bigger, bigger projects. So... I don't know. I'm just excited with what you said, but let's see how technology also enables. Because I think we are at the point now that technology is probably enabling more than ever. That's true. That's true. It's exciting times, to be honest. So yeah. The future is bright, but as of now, I think the WFM community struggles with this issue. Now, first of first of all, these workforce management tools that we get to help us with these airline calculations and such. I don't think they come with enough documentation, yeah? And there isn't enough training uh, for workspace management professionals, right? So you would you would find literally almost everybody doing it wrong. <laughs> so what, one of those common mistakes is to figure out the headcount requirement, or let's say FTEs, they will take weekly or monthly volume they have and try to define one single FTE number <laughs> out of that. And that's a really, really average number, which usually ends up, you know, leaving you with understaffed queues because queues are by nature dynamic. So the volume changes across intervals of hours, changes from day to day. Sometimes there are also weekly patterns. So if you want to account for all of those, there's got to be a different approach. You need to, you know, handle your calculations at lower intervals and then try to figure out with this complicated algorithm. <laughs> How many headcount do you actually need? So 
yeah, this this is just to 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 show you that there are such many cases where people do it mm -hmm. wrong, and we've got to come up with really ways of making it easier for people. Yeah, a good point. Good point. Uh, another another question I had prepared for you. I mean, you we kind of like fast track a lot of the questions I had prepared. One was around kind of like strategies like like with you you spoke a bit on the work you have been doing and kind of like speak true but like now with how things are today and we have been on that fast paced technology enabling moment is there any strategies that you think or that may not be necessarily technological strategies could be more process strategies that our we as professionals could employ to kind of optimize our planning processes Any ideas that come to mind? Strategies to optimize our planning process. One thing I think everybody has to do planning way in advance because you, you may not have enough time to do these, all these long calculations and to consider all the, all the things that you need to consider if you do it late. So that, that's, that's, I think, one important strategy. Another thing, use improved methods, uh, not just simple app, averaging all the time because that will leave you too far away from the, the, the accuracy well complication doesn't always mean better results but improved uh, more robust methods will will most likely leave you with better accuracy so that's yeah. another point I, should, I, yeah. I still recall the last time we spoke about the averages of averages and inputting yeah. averages everywhere and then we we don't oh. even know what the actual number is so i think it's good good call out Yes, that related to this, having multiple models, it's always a good thing. So people should really give attention to what models they're using for, for these calculations they use. That, it shouldn't always be this you know, gut feeling because that's how most people work. You, you, we need to be able to explain our decisions and there's not better way than doing it scientifically you know, with calculations, yeah. with models, formulas. Yeah, I think those... Those could be good additions to any, any workforce management team. Yeah. It, let me, I think one of the last topics we spoke the last time was about data science and the future of WFM in, kind of empowered and get more help. And I think more people with skill sets touching on data science because it's a very valuable skill set to have on as WFM professionals. How do you see that evolving? Is there any trends that you think that? Is the industry paying more attention to that skill set? Yes, I think there's a good trend, but not enough. You know why? Because workforce management is wide and it requires quite large range of skills. So look at forecasting. Forecasting on its own, it's, it's a profession that you, you may go to university and learn only forecasting. Capacity planning, all those complicated calculations. How else are you going to do if you don't really know what you're doing? Scheduling, creating the most optimum schedule. It's not easy. So somebody with just contact center experience, senior agent or whatever, cannot really be a workforce management professional. Shouldn't be like that because you know that's how it works usually, right? It's the it's I, kind I, of the I old ways of doing things. Yes, it, sh it, sh it shouldn't be like that. The, the companies should really invest in workforce management people, train them, maybe even hire people with you know relevant skills. It needs, I think, people like data scientists with technical skills, tool skills, mathematical background, statisticians, mm -hmm. because otherwise we will always be relying on gut feeling. I agree. It's not a bad thing, but I think it comes short in many cases. Yeah, and I, I, if you allow me to complement, I think the only, there are multiple skills, like you said. I think one that is also very important, which is more normally more present on kind of business analytics or kind of like more consulting types of profiles, which is about storytelling. And I think planning, even though it has a lot of math involved and you, you need a very deep analytical background, there is a lot of storytelling. Like no matter how good you are technically, if you are not able, not able to present your story, present scenarios to pre help facilitate decision-making, it's going to be very limited to the power and the impact you can have in the business. So that would be how I would complement yours. But I, it's good that you, t that you see that it's improving, even if I agree with you that it's not at the right pace yet, because we are still very traditional on assuming that we can grow from within, but then you want all the amazing results and you don't have the skill set. And that is not to blame the professionals. I think the professionals need to be, especially the managers and directors of their areas, they should help 
paving the way to develop these skill sets for for individuals. Mm. That's right. Thank you. So, quick word on your articles. So you wrote, like I said, a few very recently. One of which was around that R with WFM, the package that you that you just mentioned. But I wanted to kind of like go to a specific one. One of the last ones we wrote was about kind of like how many ads you need and like really kind of like this, I think you even used kind of the gig economy and you touched a bit on the different types of workspace and benefiting from that. Traditionally, we always have like nine to six people. We are getting more and more people that have different needs that probably even want to combine jobs. What's your thoughts here? Because I think as this evolves, probably the old traditional ways of planning, they are on a path to fail very, very, very quick. I think gig economy type of scheduling is the future, right? Yeah. Because one thing, you will have a wide workforce with so many different types of availability. So you can, you can, guarantee, you can be sure that there will always be coverage because we, we have different people and you won't, you won't be alone. You will never be alone. There's going to be always somebody to yeah. work in that interval. People have different lifestyles, different things that they do. So that guarantees you good service level. Another thing, it's also easier to achieve higher schedule efficiency. It's also cheaper because you won't, won't have to, you know, provide all labor incentives that comes with, you know, the normal contracts. So it has many advantages, higher service level, also it's cheaper, and it also, you know, helps you to achieve higher scheduling efficiency. And probably motivates the, the, the employees because in the end of the day, if they get the better work-life balance, they are even more willing to stay retention wise. So I think that's also I kind of focus too much on the employer side, but that's true. Yeah. That's, that's one of the reasons people prefer, prefer, you know, to be in the gig economy yeah, to do jobs like, you know, driving Uber and, and such. So I think contact centers need to go in this direction. There's absolutely no reason why that shouldn't be possible. You can, you can not hire, but train multiple people on certain, you know, skills and then make them available to work your contact center tasks based on their availability. And then you pay them based on their productivity and per hour. Mm-hmm. So this can be this can be done. I'm sure there are attempts in some places, especially after the you know coronavirus pandemic, because everybody went back home. I'm sure people have thought about these options, but maybe there isn't enough. And I, I think this has got to be the future. This has got to be the future of not just contact centers, but probably every industry. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. totally makes sense. So let me take the kind of the, the path you, you, you got me here. So we talk about work-life balance. Last time we kind of ended on the note about that forecasting is never going to be right. Like, And we many times when it's totally right, 100% is because we did something wrong. And one of the things that we spoke, even though we didn't say it, is that concept of the pursuit of perfection that I think everyone that works on planning and forecasting has. Like, you always want the perfect plan. You always want the perfect forecast, which is stressful. To be in the, at the end of the day, we even talk about the forecaster being a very lonely job because you are kind of alone on that pursuit. I wanted to shift completely gears here and, and ask you about what, what, what are your thoughts on that high pressure pursuit of perfection? And what is the... And how much could this hurt mental health and well-being on the actual WFM professionals? That, that's a very good question. <laughs> I think there is unnecessary pressure, right? It's unnecessary because you, you don't really need to be uh, 100% accurate. To be honest, for workforce management, what's the, the, the most important number? I think it's the headcount requirement, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. Or, or the heads that you schedule at the end of the day and the things that we forecast first of all are the likes of volume and agent productivity numbers so the the, the headcount requirement is not so what is it sensitive to the volume changes because you know 10 people will, will most you know will will be very comfortable doing what requires 11 people your service level won't be affected too much by that. Maybe they will be a little more occupied. We're talking about small queues. It's, it's more you know, significant when it comes to small queues, but larger queues, it gets less and less significant. So 
there is no need. There is no need for all the strays. You you will be just fine if your you know accuracy is ninety percent. Sometimes even less than that should be fine. And and I think the stress comes mostly because of the the management and the way they see numbers. We workforce management people are not I don't know we're not holding some crystal balls. <laughs> we're not able to tell the future. It's it's yeah. by by you know best case it's just a good assumption. It's a it's a forecast. It's just trying to see the future, looking at the past. Mm-hmm. So you can, and, and many times we, I think we spoke about this last time, is that there are even other variables that impact more the most important number, which, which is the FTI requ- FT requirements that could be like HT, shrinkage, etc. And and we tend to focus too much on the volume, on that forecast accuracy number, because it's the one that kind of it's like our flagship KPI. And I agree with you, the management has probably a lot to do on how they read numbers and how they should read numbers to take stress away from from their teams as well true yeah there, there, there shouldn't be stress they, they they shouldn't i think there's got to be awareness creation regarding this that numbers they don't have to be perfect they don't have to be 100 percent accurate you can still have a well-planned healthy coverage with less accurate you know forecast and workforce management people also should should understand this fact and just relax a little bit about it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's true, but the the reality is that across the networks that I see a lot of people stressing, as well as I would say some probably go as deep as burning out and they had to change jobs or because they the pressure is, is too high and, and could be because of this, could be because of other reasons. And I think you you said a good kind of like strategy or practice, which is like how to create that awareness to maybe less perfect numbers are as good as those probably biased perfect numbers because they don't exist like a, what's a, what's a perfect number on forecasting it's like <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know how to answer that i could question i don't know if you yeah. can if your planning is off you're more likely to be off not because of the forecast that you made on volume or ht or anything but because of missing one important parameter or whatever yeah. uh, so or external environment yes or else. not considering some external environment or some business decision that you should have considered mm-hmm. that's that's most likely why as far as your approach and your method is correct, the little difference that you, you applied on your, <laughs> on your parameter mm-hmm. methods, it, it won't reflect too much, really. Uh, because at the end of the day, the, what matters is the headcount requirement, and those numbers are not very sensitive. I'm yeah. telling you. So you, you will be just fine with, I don't know, 85% accuracy in your volume forecast. Yeah. I think that that's good because it, if we think about on the pressure that is for the perfect number and that pursuit of perfection that I think everyone everyone I know that works on forecasting and planning has that somehow ingrained because it's how traditionally we always were designed by concept to look at things. If we, if we can create that awareness, I think it would definitely benefit and probably change gears because maybe instead of you forecasting so deeply for in the investment you do for the right contact number in terms of forecast, maybe focus on the shrinkage, understand it better. How does it varies between teams between environments what variables really matter there like why do we have more out of office in office like can i forecast that can even if it's not forecasting backcasting trying to correlate that with different environments and probably that's the best solution for you to improve your number exactly and and from a well-being perspective you are even shifting gears from numbers to actually meaningful conversations with the business because you are now talking about people. What really matters to them? Like, that's exactly what is going to matter to me. Like, why are they more absent on their like, less productive hours? Maybe there is something I can, I can do. And I think that can help to ease the stress and getting, and, and by the way, probably comes with the benefit as well that professionals, double fan professionals become more recognized because they are now talking about different things. It's not no longer just the productivity and the forecast numbers. Yeah. I don't know what you think about it. Because I, th- I think it's a super valid topic that nowadays, at least for me, is getting more and more present because I'm seeing a lot of people burning out with that pursuit of perfection. I hope this this podcast will help. <laughs> <laughs> um, but absolutely, th- there is no way. I think that workforce management planning can be fun. People just need to understand how they should plan and then accept that accuracy is fine. Yeah, and then I, I like what you mentioned about shrinkage shrinkage and other smaller parameters like that which are not given enough focus they are more impactful than actually the volume itself so if such things are are properly considered 
we should we should be able to keep our jobs <laughs> <laughs> i would i would kind of like end this part of the conversation with with a challenge for everyone listening which is try to do a simple analysis on build break down your planning for a month or whatever it is and isolate the main variables shrinkage break it down like ht whatever other variables you use for planning concurrency break it down and then create weights on how much each one impacts the, the actual output of the end number and learn from that and even share those learnings with your business and not do it by gut really go deep in the numbers if you don't have the resources technical resources to do the analysis ask someone for help or like ask peers ask another colleague that has the technical skills to help and guide you because this could be an important step to foster a more supportive work environment that encourages these discussions like with the business and probably indirectly you are going to work on your kind of like work well-being environment at work like like how how good the, the environment is and probably you are even helping the different agents working on your environment the supervisor because everyone is more aware and maybe you are talking less about oh your productivity target is 10 you are at eight you need to do something why why, why did, go deep really uh, that would be my exercise challenge for everyone is like and, and then share your findings with us i think i would love to see how if that dramatically changes or or helps someone to get more recognition for the work they do that's a good advice I'll do myself. <laughs> let's see let's see if anyone gets back to us uh, and that could be a good even i would i would challenge if anyone gets back to us maybe we can do another uh podcast the two of us with that person whoever it is or write an article together on the findings and is there is there anything that could be shared across the industry that help us surprised uh, to see how, how, how this would go so you said that you have been working on very exciting things coming what more do you think it's waiting down the line for for wfm like we spoke about multiple things last time but i like we had multiple technology advances recently i think there is a lot of people asking like am i going to lose my job with ai and all of those things what kind of like what do you feel like that is going to happen in the next few months or if anything at all i don't know what what's your thoughts there to be honest I, i'm i'm not scared of ai i don't think ai will replace especially jobs like mine <laughs> because it really needs a lot of human involvement human gut feeling decisions it's now all numbers right maybe jobs like the you know those done by agents could be replaced but not mine what but we should we should really take advantage of the opportunity i'm really excited about the advancements especially being done very recently the likes of chat gpt and a lot of other ais and it can improve how we do our job and it will necessarily be important to understand how that that, that can be used to optimize what we do but when it comes to replacing us i don't think that's happening for example chat gpt helped me to to write my thesis huh this i'm admitting <laughs> it helps me sometimes to write my blogs as well so it's you taking advantage of the, like, the tools when i have very little questions regarding you know some code or something i just type it in and it gives me the answer it writes my emails mostly uh, especially for, for people like me who struggle with, I don't know, English or, you know, writing the proper article. <laughs> yeah. They take advantage of that because ChatGPT is, I think, the, 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 the most basic form of AI. It can be more advanced than that because it's just, you know, conversation. But look at it. Already at this stage, you can take a lot of advantage out of it and, 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 and optimize how you do your job. So... I think the future is bright. It's nothing to be scared of, but it's important to keep yourself, you know, up to date with those things. I like to mention that, uh, to be fair, I was recently on, on a panel about AI and one of the topics we were discussing is what does the future look like in AI for the future? What, what does it mean? Especially in kind of the work environment. And one of the things I really believe deeply is that AI will enhance ourselves. So as humans, what we need to enhance ourselves with AI. And AI is going to play a huge role in that because it's us figuring out what how to use it. It's like 
every decade now and then there, there is a revolution. We had different industrial revolutions, revolutions with technology, with the internet. And now it's another thing is like, even with social media, we did not stop to getting together as humans. Like we still get together. We still go to restaurants. I think AI is going to be probably going to do the same job, like helping you become better professional. And it's our individual job to figure out what I will do. For sure, it will change certain things we do today, which I think is always good. I mean, it will replace certain tasks, but the non-value added work is going away it does not necessarily mean that we are out of a job. True, that's 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 true. I, I really like the way you use AI at in our Discord group to ask questions and how did you integrate Discord to... So it, uh, I, I did some research. There were a few multiple ways. There are either plugins already existent. There was ones you can code in. But that's true. In our Discord community, we just have ChatGPT built in. So if you have a question and you don't know the answer, you can call him up and, hey, help me out here. Let me know your thoughts. It's always good to have that kind of style of conversation with, with AI tools. Because like you said, I even use it for one of the questions that was done there about labor law and i don't know the answer we can leverage ai and i think like things like chat gpt or bard that are more in vogue it will replace somehow search traditional search because now you can ask the question in a way that is fed with meaning when you go through google and you just randomly try to go across different articles you don't you never know where you will land and if it's actually valuable (laughs) i can stop googling (laughs) so you are a very pro chat GPT, I can see. With, with literally everything. I probably makes me lazy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it improves my work. That's yeah, I see. That's fine. So one last question for you. So last time when we were together, we we're talking about like the big things that were coming for the industry. I wanted to end on kind of like going back to the beginning. So and give you the word to you. So like you said, working on very exciting things. I think you have a good fan base here as well. So I'm excited to see what 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 you will get out soon. What can we expect from you moving forward? That, that's a good question. I think I see myself as somebody who can improve workforce management uh, and bring it more to the scientific side. So I will keep on working on projects like this one, the, the one I discussed earlier, to wanting to make workforce management more automated, faster. And another thing to, to avoid all these <laughs> labor intensive tasks that we have when we spend our most of our time on. So I really don't know what's gonna be my next task, but for now, I'm, I'm writing blogs. I am also trying to optimize my R package at the RWFM. Mm-hmm. Probably be moving it to other platforms like C, C++, because it will be faster. Exploring other I technologies, have, right? Yes. I've also been recently very interested in using some automation for real-time analysis. So a way of real-time forecasting that basically tells you what actions that you need to take based on what's happening real time. Because real time analysis, I think most of it's done manually currently. And it also is, you know, labor intensive, takes a lot of people to do that. If the system can do it for you, or maybe even suggest the actions that you need to do, that will be, that will be helpful. So I'm thinking about those. I'm, So we can speak offline on that because I, this is something I've been working over the last almost two years, which this concept of real-time alarmistic so i really think that the tool should give you the right alarmistic and you act upon things that matter and not you trying to find things that even remotely are relevant for you to look at i totally agree with you it's very manual and i think there is a huge opportunity there so i would love to continue this conversation with you don't have time right now but that's a good one for a follow-up any any final words for our listeners I really would like more and more people to be involved in our WWFM community because there's a lot of professionals, experienced people. There's so much knowledge. It would be better to to use those platforms that we have from Telegram, on Discord, and also the you know WWFM pages here and there. So let's meet. Let's talk. Let's bring it together. That's my message. Thank you so much. That's found so. Wonderful having you back on on the show. I wish you all the best. Looking forward to see more work from you. 
and you are part of the family, so we are always welcome back and speak to you soon. Thank you very much. It was an honor to come back. It was really fun talking with you. And I hope to be here more often to contribute to the community. I hope you won't be tired of me, but yeah, I'll be around. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.